Hello, my name is Jared Skeens and welcome to the Zoom Room. Today we want to look at Pure Maths 3, A -level, Cambridge A-Level Math, Pure Maths 3, May-June Series 2020, Paper 33. So again, 2020 is the beginning of the new syllabus cycle. And uh, this is Pure Math 3, uh, Paper 33. So these are the work solutions and again, work on developing your mental uh, strategy for working through the problems. So here we have solved the inequality and you see that we have this modulus inequality. So again, when you have uh, modulus on one side but not the other, you'll split it into two different parts. Uh, one for the plus and one distributing the minus on the right hand side. But in this case, we have modulus on both sides. So we're gonna use the square both sides method. And then you don't have to worry about the plus or minus part. So when you square the left-hand side, you get four X squared minus four X plus one. Greater than, don't forget to distribute your square to multiplication. Three squared is nine. X plus two squared is X squared plus four X plus four. Distribute the nine. Then we wanna move everything over to one side. So notice we're moving everything over to the right-hand side. So nine X squared minus four X squared is five X squared. 36 X plus four X is 40 X and 36 minus one is 35. And the pointy part of the inequality is pointing towards the X squared. So that will be a less than zero. These are all divisible by five. So that reduces it down a little more. We get X squared plus eight X plus seven. That can factor into X plus seven times X plus one. Notice it's less than zero, meaning we're looking for the negative section. If we put negative seven and negative one on our number line and draw our parabola through it, we can see the positive sections on the outside and the negative section in the middle. The negative section is what we want. So X is less than negative one and greater than negative seven. So we put uh, negative seven uh, is less than X is less than negative one. We do not put equal twos because the inequality does not have an equal to. So be careful not to include those. So that's the first question. The second one, find the exact value of the integral from zero to one of two minus X times E to the negative two X DX. You should recognize this as an integration by parts. Why? Because this is a product of two different uh, terms with X in it. You have two minus X is one term, multiplying the E to the negative two X is the other term. So whenever you have the product or quotient of uh, two different X terms, we're gonna use integration by parts. Then the key is which one do we have for the U and which one do we have for the DV? Generally, we pick the one that reduces for the U, like in this case, two minus X reduces to a negative DX. There's no more X's, so that's a reduction. We usually choose that for the U. And for the DV, we choose something that is, tends to be cyclical, like e to, the, e to the X just becomes E to the X, whether you're deriving or integrating. So this works out quite nicely. The only time we don't pick the one that reduces for the U is if the other one cannot integrate. If you cannot integrate one of the terms, then that will be the U and the other one will be the DV. But in this case, it works out nicely. The two minus X, when you derive it, uh, reduces. There's no more X in the term. And the E to the negative two X then is put on the DV. With the DX at the end, you integrate it and you get a negative one half e to the negative two x. So now we just have to follow the formula. Again, remember the formula is in the Cambridge formula uh, sheet that you are allowed to have when you take the exam. And uh, if you don't happen to have it with you, it's MF19. So you can look up Cambridge uh, A-level formula sheet MF19 on the internet and I'm sure you can find it. Uh, so for the formula, you take uh, V times U or U times V. So 
Here's the two minus X right here. And then the negative one half I put out front and the E to the negative two X I put in the back. So U times V minus the integral from zero to one of V DU. So these two negatives make a positive. This negative is part of the formula minus the integral. That's part of the formula. Once you get past the integral sign, it's now positive because these two negatives cancel out. And we have one half e to the negative two x dx. So we no longer have to integrate this left-hand side. It's already set to go. We only have this integral right here, which now we can do. So the integral of e to the negative two x is a, a negative one fourth e to the negative two x. So this negative is from the negative right here. And this negative is from the formula back up here. So those two cancel to make a positive. And then we, uh, now we evaluate it from zero to one. Don't forget you do top minus bottom. So when we plug a one in, two minus one is one times negative one half is negative one half. When we put a one up here, we just get e to the negative two. When we put a one over here, we get plus one fourth e to the negative two minus the bottom when we plug in a zero. Uh, when we plug in a zero here, we get two. The twos cancel, leaving us with a negative one. And when we put a zero up here, all of this becomes zero, e to the zero is one. One times the negative one is negative one. Plug in a zero here, you get one times one fourth is one fourth. So we distribute the negative, make it plus one minus one fourth. These two combine to give us a negative one fourth e to the negative two. These two over here combine to give us a plus three fourths. I just rewrote it so that the three fourths is in the front minus one fourth e to the negative two. This is the correct answer. You can also write it in this form here on the right where you factor out the one fourth and then you have three minus e to the negative two inside the parentheses. Either form is fine. Moving on, 3a show that the equation ln of one plus e to the negative x plus two x equals zero can be expressed as a quadratic in uh, terms of e to the x. So let's start with our equation here. First thing we're gonna do is, get, is move the two x to the right. And then we're gonna exponentiate both sides base e. That cancels out the ln on the left, gives us the one plus e to the negative x equals. And then on the right, we have e raised now to the negative two x. So I move it all over. Actually, I move the left-hand side over to the right-hand side. So e to the negative two x minus e to the negative x minus one equals zero. Then I write them as fractions, one over e to the two x minus one over e to the x minus one equals zero. We're gonna clear the fractions by multiplying everything by e to the two x. So over here we get one minus e to the x minus e to the two x equals zero. Again, rewriting it in proper order and then showing that the 2x can be written as e to the x squared and then plus e to the x minus one equals zero. So now we have it as a quadratic in terms of e to the x. It looks tempting to st stop right up here because it is a quadratic, but it's in e to the negative x. So I don't know if Cambridge would accept that or not. Technically they want e to the x uh, so I went ahead and did these few extra steps to make sure that it's an e to the x form. Hence, part B, solve the equation, giving your answer correct to three decimal places. Well, here is our e quadratic up here. So we're going to solve it using the quadratic equation. e to the x equals a negative b, so our b is a 1, so negative one plus or minus square root b squared, so that's one squared, minus four ac all over two a. This right here becomes one plus four, which is root five. So e to the x equals negative one plus uh, or minus root five over two. It will not equal the negative one minus root five over two because this ends up being a negative number. 
and you can't have a base raised to a power equaling a negative number. So that one gets thrown out. This one over here, we lawn both sides to get rid of the E so that we now have X by itself. And then when you plug that into your calculator, X equals a negative 0.481, negative 0.481. Number four, the equation of a curve is Y equals X times the inverse tangent of one half X find dy dx. So we're doing the derivative. Again, this is the product rule. We have an x term multiplied by another term with x in it. And uh, so we're going to use the product rule. You might want to have, again, your formula sheet handy uh, because we're doing the derivative of an inverse tangent function, which uh, is a little difficult to memorize. So in the formula, product formula is 1 d2. So the derivative of this inverse tangent is one over, uh, kind. it's an a squared where a is a one plus this argument squared. So when you square the argument, you get one fourth x squared. And then the derivative of the inside would be one half. So don't forget to take the derivative of the argument, one half dx. And then, so that's the one d2 and then plus the two d1. Well, the derivative of x is just 1 dx, so that simplifies out. Uh, now, when we look at this over here, we've got a complex fraction. That is, we have a fraction within a fraction. So in the denominator, we're going to factor out this 1 fourth. And when you factor out the 1 fourth, that leaves you with 4 plus x squared. So this is the denominator right here, just factoring out the one fourth. Now that the, we have the one fourth factored out, we can uh, take care of this complex fraction part. We can invert and multiply. So that becomes four on top. The one fourth flips over, becomes four on top and just four plus X squared uh, in the bottom. The one half X is still out front and the inverse tangent of one half X is still in the back. Then our two from the one half cancels with the four. And I go ahead and move the X up into the numerator with the two that's left. And so our reduced form is two X over X squared plus four plus inverse tangent of one half X. Now the tangent to the curve uh, at the point where uh, X equals two meets the y-axis at the point with coordinates 0p. They don't even give us a graph on this one. So it makes it a little bit more, say, visually challenging because we don't have a picture. All you need to know is that you have a curve. Okay, so you got this, you got this curve. It doesn't really matter its orientation. And at x equals 2, you have a tangent line. So your tangent line on your curve is going to go off toward your y-axis and it's gonna meet the y-axis at the point zero P. So because it says tangent, we can use the derivative to find the equation of the tangent line. The derivative will give us slope at that point. So we need to do derivative first um, and actually what I do is I also want to find the complete point at X equals two. So I plug in two into the function. We just call this our, uh, our Y function up here. So Y of two, plug a two in. And when you plug a two into that, uh, you get 1.571. So the X coordinate is the two, the Y coordinate is the 1.571. That is the point at the point of tangency. Then we take the derivative, evaluating it at two. And so when we take the derivative, we're gonna take the derivative, uh, which we already found down here. We already found the derivative. So this equation right here is our derivative. And we just plug two into it. So no two times two is four. Two squared is also four. All of this reduces to four over eight, which is one half. And then when we put in a two up here, that cancels with the one half, gives us an inverse tangent of one. And when we combine this one half, plus
plus the inverse tangent of one, we get 1.285. By the way, put your calculator in radians mode because if you have it in degree mode, then you have to worry about the unit degree. By having it in radian modes, radians is the non-unit unit. So you don't have to worry about units <clears throat> when you're in radian mode. So this is 1.285. That becomes our slope. So our tangent line has a y equals mx plus c form to it. We just found the slope at two. So that's 1.285. Now to find the plus c, we plug in our, uh, our x and y point that we have. Our x is the two and the y is the 1.571. So when you calculate that, c comes out to a negative one and c is the y-intercept, meaning it's where it's crossing the y-axis. So that happens to be our letter p. So c is the letter p, therefore p is a negative one. Number five, by first expressing the equation tan theta times tan theta plus 45 equals uh, two cotangent two theta as a quadratic in terms of tangent, then we will solve it. Uh, and notice this is degrees, so set your calculator now back to degree mode. And the domain is for the first quadrant only. So first thing we need to do is we need to convert this into a quadratic that is just in tangent. So this outside tangent, no problem. The middle tangent here, tangent of theta plus 45, that's a, your sum identity for tangent. So look that up in your formula sheet and, uh, or you can look it up on the internet, tan theta plus tan 45 all over one minus tan theta tan 45 equals two times now cotangent is the reciprocal function of tangent. So you get one over two tan, or one over tan two theta for that part. And the tan two theta is also a double angle identity in your formula sheet. So notice uh, the tan two theta identity is a fraction. And so since this is under one, we're just gonna flip the fraction over so that the denominator of that identity ends up on top. And then the numerator of it ends up in the denominator because it's flipped over the one here, it's reciprocated. Then the twos of that identity with the two on the outside cancel. And over here on the left, your tan of 45 uh, from your special triangle is just one. Uh, you can do it on your calculator as well. Those just reduce to a one. So now you have one times tan theta and a plus one here. Uh, so that um, now has uh, that. So now we're gonna cross multiply. We're gonna take this tangent here, multiply it by all this up here. So that's gonna give us a tan squared. Well, I forgot to write the theta here. <laughs> I just noticed that I forgot to write the theta in. And then we have the tan theta plus one. And then over here, we have this one minus tan theta right here times the one minus tan squared theta. So we multiply these through, we get tan cubed theta plus tan squared theta equals, when we distribute this out, one times one is one, one times a negative tan squared is a negative tan squared. And this one times negative tan is negative tan theta. And our negative tan squared times negative tan is a positive tan cubed. Notice there's a tan cubed on both sides. You can subtract that away and cancel it out. Uh, then we add tan squared over to the, move everything to the left. And we end up with two tan squared theta plus tan theta minus one equals zero. That can now factor, giving us two tan theta minus one times tan theta plus one equals zero. Those become tan theta equals one half and tan theta equals negative one. When we, uh, or you could just stop right here, tan is negative in the second and fourth quadrants. Our domain is only for first quadrant. 
So we, we're gonna throw out anything that we get from the second and fourth quadrant. It's not because we can't get a value for it. It's because the quadrants uh, are not the quadrants that we want. So that one gets thrown out. Over here, tangent is positive. One half is positive. Tangent is positive in the first and third. We're gonna go ahead and throw out the third quadrant. The only one we need is the first quadrant. And when you do that on your calculator, theta equals 26.6 degrees. Moving on to 6a by sketching a suitable pair of graphs, show that the equation x to the fifth equals two plus x has exactly one real, one real root. So I graph the x to the fifth on this graph right here. It's easier than what you might think. You might think, well, I don't know how to graph a fifth power uh, polynomial, but since there's no other terms with it, this one is quite easy. Obviously, zero to the fifth is zero. One to any power is just one. A negative one to an odd power is negative. So you got zero, zero, one, 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 negative one. Really, a fifth power follows the same pattern as a cubic, except it's stretched, it's, it goes up faster, it's more steep and it's going up and going down than the x cubed, but the shape basically looks like an x cubed graph. Uh, then we have on the other side, the two plus x, I just switched it around to x plus two, follows our linear graph. So it crosses the y-axis at two with a slope of up one over one. So I drew the line through there and notice they intersect at one point, therefore, uh, this equation has one real root. That is, if you were to graph it where everything was on one side set equal to zero, it would cross your x-axis in one place. Also notice it's a fifth power. Fifth powers have to have one real root because your imaginary numbers come in pairs. So two roots could be imaginary another two roots could be imaginary. So you can have up to four imaginary roots. You still have to have one real root, uh, or you could have had uh, two imaginary and three real roots, but we can see from this graph here that there is one point of intersection. So there's only one real root. The other four are pairs of imaginary numbers. Part B, show that if a sequence of values given by this iteration formula that it will converge to the root of part A. Well, part A starts with this equation right here. So we have to show that this one here is related to this one down here. And if you can show that they're related, then uh, we're pretty certain that this will converge to the appropriate root. You can either work from this iterative formula uh, back to the original, or you can start with the original and go to the iterative formula. The thing is this, if you start with the original, you got to solve for one of the x's. And even though it looks like there's only two, you got to remember that there's five powers of x. So it could be like x to the x to the fourth, x squared times x cubed. There's a lot of different ways of arranging this. And by looking at the outcome, it might be a little tricky doing it that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the iterative one and work back to the original. It's a little bit easier for this particular problem. So we're gonna multiply the five X to the fourth minus one to the left, giving us five X to the fifth minus one. Then we're gonna subtract the four X to the fifth to the other side. And that's gonna give us X to the fifth minus X equals two. And all we have to do is add to the x over. And we've shown that the, the iterative formula is indeed related to this original x to the fifth, uh, two plus x. I just didn't write two plus x, I put x plus two, but it, it's connected. So that means it will converge. So that's all you have to do there. Now we get down to the iteration part. Use the iterative formula with an initial value of 1.5 to calculate the root correct to three decimal places, and each iteration needs to go to five decimal places. So we start with the 1.5. Uh, 
Now, because they put X to the one, I used X to the one and went from there. Sometimes people will start off with the first one as being X to the zero, and then they count the next one as the first iteration. So it doesn't really matter. They start with X to the one. So that's what we'll start with 1.5. You plug it in for your X here on the right hand side. You work it out on your calculator. And so your new X being our now second uh, value of X is 1.33162. Notice take it to five decimal places. And of course the fifth one is rounded if, uh, if, uh, if you need to round it. And then we take this one, plug it back into X again. So when you plug it back into your calculator, after you've done it once, you can go back to the 1.5 and instead of replacing it with 1.33162, just replace the 1.5 with the answer key on your calculator, both for the top X and for the bottom X. And then that way, every time you hit the equal sign, it will give you the next iteration without having to retype the numbers in every time. So just make sure you hit it one at a time though. When you hit the equal sign, uh, the 1.33162 will turn into a 1.27352. And when you hit it again, becomes 1.26724. And when you hit it again, becomes 1.26717. So we see that to three decimal places, we see that the twos didn't change for a while, the sixes didn't change, and also the sevens. So notice on the high side, we have a two, on the low side, we have a one. So that means we're pretty certain that the 0.267 will continue and only these last little numbers will change. So 1.267 is accurate to three decimal places. Number seven, we have a partial fraction. So let f of x equals two over a two x minus one times two x plus one. Express this in partial fractions. It's only worth two points because this is a uh, simple denominators. So we put a over two x minus one plus b over two x plus one. These were quite easy. If x equals one half, a comes out to one. So what we're saying there, Notice the bottom here, if you solve it, you get one half. Of course, we don't wanna put it in the denominator because it gives you a zero there. So we're gonna take this two X minus one, multiply it by all the terms. So when you multiply it by the B and you put in the one half, it makes it zero, which cancels out this whole term. The A, it cancels out the denominator. So all you're left with A. And over here on the right, it cancels out the two X minus one. So all you have is two over two X plus one, put in the one half, one half times two is one plus one is two, two over two is one. Then if you solve for the B, notice this gives you a negative one half and you're multiplying it through. So it cancels here, leaving you B by itself, ends up in the numerator here, which when you put in negative one half will make it zero, canceling out, canceling out that entire term also cancels out the two X plus one. So all you have left is this over here. Plugging in your negative one half gives you a negative one minus one's a negative two. Two divided by negative two is negative one. So here is your partial fractions. The A is one over two X minus one minus the one for the B over two X plus one are your partial fractions. Now, using your answer to part A, show that f of x squared equals all of this. Well, if we go back to our f of x, our f of x, uh, we're not gonna want to use this. We're gonna want to use this. This is our new f of x, and we're gonna square it. So notice I put it down here. I rewrote it down here with parentheses squared, because this represents our f of x function, but in partial fractions. We're gonna square it. So when you square it, notice you get the square of the first term as the, as the first, then square the last term at the end. And in the middle, when, they, when you do the nose times mouth or the inners times the outers, you get two times uh, the one term and the other term. Okay, so it's like minus two AB. So it's like A squared minus two AB plus B squared is if this is your A term and B term. So this middle, if you notice, is 
actually our original function. So since that is our original function, or actually, because there's a negative in front, it's a negative of the original function, which then we can put in our partial fractions, substitute that in, distribute the negative, and bring down the first and last term. And voila, you have your thing that you're trying to show, this polynomial here, or rational function. OK. Now part C, hence show that the integral of f, f of x squared dx equals two fifths plus one half ln to the uh, ln of five ninths. So notice this f of x squared is just what we got done doing. We got just got done showing uh, that f of x squared is this big long thing here. So that is what we're going to integrate is that big long thing. Notice I brought up the denominators on the front and the back and brought them up to as negative exponents because these are both algebraic. The middle two have an exponent of negative one. We can't use the algebra uh, formula on that because we'll get an undefined uh, problem there. That's actually not algebraic, it's actually logarithmic. So on the first one, we add one, we get negative one, multiply, uh, we, sorry, we divide by that number. So when we divide by the negative one, that gives us our negative. And we also have to divide by the derivative of the inside. So we have to divide by this two. So that gives us a negative one half times two X minus one raised to the negative one power. Then this one here, here's a negative one half is the coefficient, uh, oh sorry, uh, the negative is the sign, the one over two X minus one is the ln, because uh, you have that, and then the two out in front, notice there's no two on top, so we have to cancel out the two by putting the one half. So the one half is to uh, offset the two that's in here. So remember ln of something is one over it, then the derivative of the inside would be a two, but if there's a one half in front, it cancels the two. Then you have this one is same thing, but with a positive one half ln of two X plus one. Then this back one is algebraic again. Again, add one, divide by that gives you a negative, and then divide by the derivative of the inside. The two make gives us, when you divide, gives us one half. So I have a negative one half, 2x plus 1 to the negative 1. And we're going to evaluate this over the bounds of integration of 1 to 2. Remember, top minus bottom. So we plug a 2 in all of this. When we plug a 2 in here, get 4 minus 1 is 3. Flipping it over because it has a negative 1 exponent gives us 1 third. 1 third times negative 1 half is negative 1 6. When we plug in a two here, we get four minus one is three. So that's negative one half ln three. When we plug a two in here, we get four plus one is five. So there's one half ln five. And when we put a two in here, get four plus one is five. Flipped over is a one fifth. One fifth times negative one half is negative one tenth. So that's the top minus the bottom is when we plug in a one. So when we plug in a one over here, we get two minus one is one. Flipped over is still one. One times negative one half is negative one half. Then when we put a one in here, we get two minus one is one. Ln of one is zero. So this entire term cancels out. Then we put in a one here, we get two plus one is three. So here's one half ln three. Put in a one here, two plus one is three. Flipped over is one third. One third times negative one half is negative one six. Now let's distribute the negative and start combining some things. So here's a negative one six minus one tenth plus factoring out the one half. Uh, notice it's ln five minus ln three. So that's gonna be ln five divided by three, which we get to down here. For right now, I just factor out the one half and gives us ln five minus ln three, then distribute the negative, so plus one half minus one half ln three plus one six. Then combine these two 
It gives you a negative 4 fifteenths. Here's ln 5 divided by 3. Uh, over here, 1 half plus 1 6 gives us 2 thirds. And we have the minus 1 half 1 3. Now move the 2 thirds to the front. So you have 2 thirds minus 4 fifteenths gives 2 fifths. And now again, factoring out the 1 half from this lawn and this lawn gives us lawn of 5 halves minus lawn 3. Again, you divide the arguments and you get lawn of 5 ninths. So 2 fifths plus 1 half lawn of 5 ninths is what they wanted us to arrive at, and that's what we got. Going on to vectors, number eight, relative to the origin, the points A, B, and D have position vectors given by OA, OB, and OD. A fourth point C is such that A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. Okay, so our points don't exactly have to be on a graph paper per se. All we need to do is draw ourselves a parallelogram. It doesn't necessarily have to have the right orientation. It's just a visual. So remember when you put A, B, C, D, they have to go in order. So A to B to C to D to back to A. So that means A, B and C, D are parallel. B, C and A, D are parallel. And even though it might not have the right spatial orientation, it will work for what we need then we're gonna choose O as our origin. we we'll just put it out here. So if we want to, uh, it says find position vector C and then verify that it's not a rhombus. Well, first let's work on finding C. Well, AD and BC are parallel, meaning they have the same direction. Once I have the direction of BC, I can just add it to B and find out what point C is. First, we need to get AD. So AD is OD minus OA, end minus start, end minus start. Excuse me. So when we do OA minus or OD minus OA, 3I minus I is 2I. There's no J's, minus 2J's, a negative 2J. 2k minus k is k. So this is the direction from A to D, which is also the direction from B to C. Now we want O to C. So to get from O to C, we need to go to OB and then plus BC, because it says position vector of C, which is OC. So to get from O to C, we're gonna first go to B, so that's OB, and then we're going to go from B to C. And as we just discussed, BC is the same direction as AD because they're parallel. And so we'll have OB plus AD. And when you add OB plus AD, two plus two is four, five minus two is three, and three plus one is four. So OC is four I plus three J plus four K. Then to determine if it's a rhombus, well, rhombus have perpendicular bisectors. So if it were a rhombus, then our BD dot AC would equal zero. Remember the dot product? It will equal zero, zero if you have perpendicular lines. So what we want to test is if BD dot AC is zero or not. So first we need to find BD. So BD is OD minus OB. And when you do that, you can go back and look, you should get one minus, one I minus five J minus K. And when we do AC, it's OC minus OA. Again, you can go back and look, you should end up with three I plus J plus three K. Then we take those and I put them into column vectors, one, negative five, negative one, three, one, three. We do the dot product, which we, means we multiply one times three plus negative five times one plus negative one times three. That gives us three minus five minus three. All of that adds up to negative five. It does not equal zero. Therefore, they are not perpendicular. And because they are not perpendicular, therefore this parallelogram is not a rhombus. 
remember a rhombus is a square that's been kind of pushed over on its, pushed over, slanted over. Uh, so this one was probably more like a, a rectangle that maybe uh, um, is a parallelogram or something. Anyway, it's not a rhombus. Part B, find angle BAD, give your answer in degrees. So this is looking for an angle. We're gonna use dot product again. Remember when you use an angle, you either go from the inner out or from the outside in. Don't go left to right or right to left. So we can do AB dot AD, or you could do BA dot DA. So make sure your arrows are either pointing into the middle or out from the middle. Don't just go left to right. A lot of students do that and they end up getting an incorrect uh, answer. So I'm going to do A to B and A to D. So AB dot AD. So we have to find AB, which is OA minus or OB minus OA. You get I plus 3J plus 2K. AD we already had found up before, 2I minus 2J plus K. Uh, then we want to find the magnitudes of both of those. So the magnitude is 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 2 squared in the square root, which gives the square root of 1 plus 9 plus 4, which is square root of 14. For AD, we do the magnitude also. So we get the square root of 2 squared plus negative 2 squared plus 1, which is root of 4 plus 4 plus 1, which is root 9, which is 3. Then we can go ahead and carry out our dot product, which is also called the scalar product. And yes, it is in your formula sheet, in the Cambridge formula sheet. So the dot part of the dot product, 1 times 2 plus uh, 3 times negative 2 plus 2 times 1, all that comes out to 2 plus 2 is 4 minus 6 is negative 2. And then on this side, we're going to have cosine theta divide by the 3 root 14. So we keep the negative two over here. We inverse cosine both sides to the negative two, which was over here, that's our numerator, divided by the three root 14, and then inverse cosine to get the theta. Theta comes out to 100.3 degrees. Don't worry about that. I know our picture looked like a, an acute angle. It doesn't matter about the angle, it just means the angle is wider than what I drew it. So don't let your drawing uh, influence your mind on that one. Uh, it comes out to 100.3 degrees for the angle between, uh, what was it, BAD. Now for part C, find the area of the parallelogram co uh, correct to three significant figures. Well, because it's a parallelogram, we can divide it in half by the diagonal and both halves will have the same area. So I took the one half and redrew it. So we have A, B, and D where BD is the diagonal. I put in the magnitudes that we found. So AB was magnitude 14, AD was magnitude three. And the angle that we found in between, we already found to be 100.3 or actually 100.26. So I'm using the formula Area of a triangle is one half AB sine C. That's our trigonometric formula for area of a triangle. One half A is three, B is root 14, sine C being the angle in between uh, sine of 100.26. So that gives us an area of 5.523. And there are two of those uh, triangles in the parallelogram. So we multiply it by two. We get 11.045 to three significant figures is 11.0. So don't forget to put the zero, 11.0, three significant figures uh, is the answer there. Number 9A, we're on complex numbers such that U and W, U and W are gonna be vectors where U minus W equals two I and U times W equals six. Find U and W giving our answers in the form of X plus I, Y, and they need to be exact, meaning we need to keep radicals and things like that. So here we have U minus W equals 2I, UW equals 6. 
divide both sides by w, u equals six over w, plug that in for the u over here, multiply everything through now by w to clear the fraction, and we have six minus w squared equals two i w. Notice this is a quadratic, so we're gonna move everything to the right, add w squared over, then we have the plus two i w, and then subtract six equals zero. This is a quadratic, so we're gonna use the quadratic formula. Negative b, well the b term is two i, so we have a negative two i, plus or minus root b squared minus four ac. So your two i squared becomes a negative four, and negative four times one times negative six is positive 24. So that gives a positive 20, which comes out as a two root five. Notice everything has a two here, so we can divide the two or distribute the two through this addition and subtraction. So that gives us a negative i plus or minus uh, root five. And uh, so I'll put the plus or minus five minus, the plus or minus root five minus i. <laughs> then if we plug that into the u, which is six over w right here, six over w, plug that in for, uh, sorry, we solve for w, plug it in for the w. And then uh, assuming we're starting with the plus root five minus i, then the conjugate would be root five mi uh, plus i. So multiply top and bottom by the conjugate pair, root five plus i top and bottom. That gives us six root five plus six i on top. When you multiply the bottom, that just gives you five plus one because a negative i times i is negative i squared. i squared is negative one, so that becomes plus one. So this then, this, uh, this plus or minus now is uh, five plus one is six. So it cancels out the six, leaving you with a plus or minus root five plus i. So the w is plus or minus root five minus i, the u is plus or minus root five plus i. So when w is a root five minus i, the u is root five plus i, and when the w is a negative root five minus i, the u is a negative root five plus i. Then part b, we have a sketch, argan diagram, Shade the region whose points represent complex number Z, satisfying the inequalities of this one here, this Z minus two minus two I less than or equal to two. This is a circle. You should recognize this as a circle. We're gonna change the inside to be Z minus because we wanna say Z, which is our vector from the center. So we wanna figure out what the center is. We need to have a minus here. So we're gonna factor out the minus, but z minus parentheses two plus two i. So that's the center and the radius is two. So let's start with that. We draw an Argan diagram where the x-axis is the real, the y-axis is the imaginary axis. So here I put zero to four, zero to four i. And so two plus two i over two on the real, up two i on the imaginary. That's our center of the circle. The radius is two. So I come out to in all four directions and draw a circle in. Then we have an angle. Remember arg represents the angle part of the vector. So the angle part of the vector, which remember you're facing zero degrees, uh, your angle needs to be between zero and pi force. Pi force is 45 degrees. So here's the angle between zero and pi fourths. And this last one is a line. The real part of Z is less than or equal to three. So in other words, this is the uh, X axis less than or equal to three. So it crosses the X at three and goes to the less than side. Uh, the angle was between the two and the circle was less than, which means inside the circle. So inside the circle, less than X, equals three and uh, within the angle from zero to pi fourths. 
Okay, so that's this area right here is the shaded part. So moving on to number 10, got this hemisphere. Uh, the hemisphere started full of water and uh, it says the depth of the water at time t is h. At time equals t equals zero, the tank is full. Then there's uh, something opened at the bottom at point A so that the water can flow out. Flow out, it flows out at a rate proportional to root H. So the fact that it's going out and your water is decreasing, this is gonna be a negative ratio or proportion. And since it says it's proportional to root H, H we need our proportionality constant. So this is gonna be a negative K root H for that. And the tank becomes empty at T equals 14, so our volume equals zero. Here we have our volume formula. <clears throat> I just distributed the one third pi here, distributed through it to get this. Show that H and T satisfy this differential equation where B is a positive constant. So let's go up here and uh, do the derivative of our volume formula. So this is going to be dv dt. Notice I just multi or divide both sides by dt. That's our change in time. On the left, we have dv dt. That's our change in volume with respect to time. That's actually the flowing out of the water. Then on the right-hand side, we have algebra here. So multiply two to the front gives us two pi r h dh dt. Notice h is our variable. The r is the radius. It's a fixed value uh, at any particular point. It's, it's a fixed uh, or our original r is a fixed value if you want to put it that way. So the dh dt is the height is changing. And uh, so derive this one on the right, three times one third is one. That gives us pi h squared dh dt. So the dv dt, that is the flowing out, that's our negative k root h, negative k root h equals this over here. I just factored out the pi since the pi is in both. And if you notice, you don't see a pi over here. So factored out the pi. Then we're gonna divide everything by root h so that our k is by itself. So we have negative k equals, and this is root h. So one minus one half is positive one half. Two minus one half is three halves. Uh, so our root h distributes through uh, the numerator. We have the pi dh dt. Now move the negative over uh, here or actually, sorry, keep the negative. We're gonna divide everything by uh, this right here because we're solving for dh dt. So since we're solving for dh dt, we're gonna divide all of this over to the left. And this is what it looks like, negative k over 2r h to the 1 half minus h to the 3 halves pi. And notice we have what we want on the bottom but the top is not B. We started without, with a proportionality constant, but that constant gets divided by pi, which is another constant. So when you take one constant, divide by another constant, you're gonna end up with uh, a constant again. So you're gonna get negative, this time we'll call it B. So this K over pi becomes B. Uh, the negative just stays in front. So this is, showing uh, this up here. So we were able to show the dh dt. Now part b, solve the differential equation and obtain an expression for t in terms of h and r. So we need to separate our variables. So we need the h's to multiply over here to the dh. We're gonna multiply the dt over here next to the negative b. <clears throat> Okay, 
So on the left, we integrate. Remember, h is our variable. So we add 1, and that gives us 3 halves. Divide by 3 halves means multiply by 2 thirds, and that gives us 4 thirds r times h to the 3 halves. And then minus, when we add 1 to the 3 halves, we get 5 halves. Divide by 5 halves means we multiply and multiply by 2 fifths. So this is pretty much just algebraic integration right here on the left, minus bt plus c. We need to put our plus c because we don't have bounds of integration. Now, we got to figure out how to get this r and t, um, or b, and we need to get the b and c figured out so that everything's in terms of r and h. So when t equals zero, h is equal to r because it was empty, meaning the height is the radius. Okay, the radius goes this way, radius also goes this way. At t equals zero, the water is full, your height is the radius. So we're plugging in r for h. So here's the h replaced with r, the h replaced with r, the t replaced with zero. So that leaves us with C equals four thirds. Uh, notice R times R to the three halves is R to the five halves minus two fifths R to the five, half, five halves. They are like terms because they both have R to the five halves. So four thirds minus two fifths is 14 fifths R to the five halves. Then we take the second set of values. When T is 14, there's no volume and no height. So when we plug in zero for the height, that is after 14 seconds, all the water has drained out. So there's no more height. So this entire left-hand side becomes zero. We get minus 14 B plus 14 fifteenths R to the five halves. So that means 14 B equals 14 fifteenths R to the five halves. Divide by the 14, the 14s cancel. B equals 1 15th R to the five halves. Plug that uh, back in for the B. So put it in here for the B. And then we're going to add it to the other side because we want to solve for time. So here's the 1 15th r to the 5 halves times t. So it was a negative b on this side. We're now adding it over here. So here's your 1 15th r to the 5 halves times t equals. So we moved the bt to this side. That means we need to move all these to the right-hand side. So we get a positive 2 fifths h to the 5 halves minus 4 thirds r h to the 3 halves plus the 14 15 r to the 5 halves already over here. Now <clears throat> we can divide everything by 1 15 r to the negative 5 halves, okay, because we're dividing it. So 1 15 inverts and multiplies and we get 30 over 5, which is 6. The r to the negative 5 halves, because it's on the bottom, the h to the positive 5 halves on top. Then when we do it over here to this middle one, negative 4 thirds divided by 1 15th is a negative 20. Get h to the 3 halves on top. When we divide the r part, 5 halves, we get 1 minus 5 halves, which is a negative 3 halves. Then when we divide over here, 14 fifteenths divided by 1 15th, the 15th cancel giving us 14. And when we divide by R to the five halves, the R to the five halves cancel. So now we have this, you could put that as your answer or you could write this as a fraction where H is over R because notice the exponents are the same. So you can put the uh, five halves on the outside h over r because it's to the negative and the six in the front. 
Same thing here with the 20 H over R with the three halves on the outside and then the 14. So these are two different ways of writing your answer. And that takes us to the end of this Pure Mass 3, May, June, 2020, paper 33. And thank you for joining me in the Zoom room. And as always, hope to see you again next time.